Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Merci d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. I'm Ted Hewitt, President of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, or what we call SHIRC Shur uh, for short. I'd like to acknowledge that SHIRC's offices are situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. As we're meeting in a virtual environment and from various locations, we also acknowledge from coast to coast to coast, the ancestral and traditional territory of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who call this land home. I am delighted to be with you today uh, to present uh, the first uh, part of our, uh, of our um, public meetings that is offered in partnership with uh, Conversation Canada. And such as is a federal organization that finances research in Canada that supports research and a training in uh, research in human science uh, and, and uh, also students uh, and also uh, academicians that, permit, that allow them to better understand human condition and human behavior and cultures and the working of society. The work of scholars in social sciences and humanities disciplines has never been more vital to respond to society's challenges and seize new opportunities from post pandemic recovery to climate change and the environment to indigenous reconciliation. We are delighted to partner with the conversation Canada to bring the perspectives of some of Canada's best and brightest scholars to the public. This series of talks provides a unique forum where we can hear directly from academics who have important views to share that can enrich our understanding of people and world affairs. Today, our guest is David Dysenhauser. David Dysenhauser is a professor at uh, the law faculty at the Toronto University. His research uh, uh, made progress the ideas that uh, the state of law and the engagement of a legal order imposes a moral discipline to the states. His work that covers subjects as diverse as administrative law, labor law, and immigration and citizenship and uh, the right of the person were, uh, were uh, named more than 100 times. He is uh, the winner of CNTH. Uh, uh, Dr. Dysenhaus began his university studies in South Africa at the height of apartheid. He saw firsthand how law, even when it's used as an instrument of oppression, opens up a space for resistance and challenge. When Dr. Dyson House came to Canada in 1988, he quickly found support for his work from Shirk. Today, his influence extends from academia to policymaking to lawmaking. In the decades since 9-11, he's been an important voice articulating and defending the rule of law in the face of threats. David is joined today by Scott White, CEO and Editor-in-Chief at The Conversation Canada. Thank you again to everyone for joining the conversation. Je vous remercie encore une fois d'être des nôtres. And now I will hand things over to Scott and Dr. Dozenhaus. Thanks so much, Ted, uh, for the introductions and welcome everyone. Um, a few words before we begin, I'd like to let our audience know that closed captioning and simultaneous interpretation are available for this event. For the closed captioning, you can click on the CC on the control bar of the video screen. And for simultaneous interpretation, click on the language icon in the top right of the screen. Today's interview will be followed by a Q&A, so please submit your questions at any time in English or French using the chat at the bottom of the conference. David, it's great to see you. Um, you're in, tell everyone where you are today. I'm, I'm sitting in my home in Oxford, England right now. And, and even though you're at U of T, I know that you're, you're uh, teaching courses and doing research at, uh, at Oxford. Is that correct? Uh, not exactly. I'm actually teaching in London, and I'm teaching for a center of which my law faculty in Toronto is a part. So one of the things that when we do these interviews, and, uh, and by the way, congratulations on the Impact Award. It's a significant uh, 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 award, and, and uh, we're very pleased to be talking with you today. One of the things I always like to ask about is, is your personal journey that, that led you into academia and specifically 
how you chose to focus on this area of, of, re of research, which is the intersection of political theory and the law. I, I grew up uh, in apartheid South Africa, and I was educated during the apartheid era. I went to university, did my undergraduate degree in the 1970s, which was a, a momentous time in South Africa. In 1976, while I was still an undergraduate, the Soweto uprising took place, which was an uprising by students in uh, Soweto, a huge township outside of Johannesburg. This uprising spread across South Africa. And uh, th this was a revolt by black students against uh, the political authorities. It was also a revolt against their parents because they thought that their parents had been rather too passive when it came to resisting apartheid. So it was difficult to uh, be educated at this time and uh, be blind to what was happening in South Africa. It so happened that the uh, courses that I had chosen uh, to major in during my undergraduate degree were uh, law and political science. I then went on to do a, a law degree after I'd finished my undergraduate degree. And this conjunction of law and politics uh, fascinated me because one could see uh, in a way from an academic point of view at that time, from a student's point of view, how the issues we were being taught about in class mattered on the ground. And, and that's really what gave me a, an abiding interest in the way that law and politics interact. So, so that was really when you started to realizing that using the law was a way to resist an, an oppressive state and, and that there was room within the system to oppose the system? Yes, that's right. So one has to understand that uh, in South Africa, uh, the legal order at that time was an order that had been inherited from uh, the time of the British, British domination of South Africa. And so we had parliamentary supremacy. We had the same government in power from 1948 until uh, the 1990s. That government had a complete grip on the law that was enacted, and it also appointed uh, the judges. This government, as is well known, was determined to implement its policy of apartheid and also to stamp out all uh, serious political opposition to its policies. And yet somehow the fact that that government still had uh, a commitment to ruling through law meant that there was a discipline exerted on what they did by legal norms. But this is something I, I learned more about during my uh, law degree than I did during my undergraduate days. But finding out that even when the government seems to have a complete grip on power, it is the case that uh, lawyers who minded to do so can find space within the law to contest oppression and discrimination. That's uh, what really led me to uh, do research later on. And that's, in a way, what I've spent my whole career uh, working on. Were there some specific cases in South Africa where, where you saw this playing out or, or you've gone back and looked at them or, or looked at them throughout your career? Well, I, I wrote my doctorate actually in, in the same place where I'm sitting right now, uh, the University of Oxford, on, on uh, the adjudication of uh, these cases during the apartheid era and the implications of that adjudication for legal and political theory. So, so, so let me give you uh, a couple of examples. One example or set of examples comes from the 1950s when uh, the South African government was beginning to implement its policy of apartheid. In order to implement that policy, it enacted a series of statutes which were known as the Group Areas Acts. These acts uh, gave to high-up government officials the authority to divide South Africa up into different residential areas and it was a criminal offense for a member of one racial group to reside in an area set aside for another. Now, of course, the way that this policy was implemented was that the officials gave the best and biggest uh, residential areas uh, to the minority white population. This could be resisted because uh, someone who came from a, a racial group that had been discriminated against through the way that their residential areas had been divided up could go to a court and say to the judge, look, the statute gives uh, a lot of authority to officials, but it doesn't give them the authority to discriminate. It doesn't give them the authority to divide up areas in a way that's unreasonable. 
and judges would on occasion uphold that kind of challenge. Now, when that happened, it was often the case that uh, either a higher court would overrule the lower court, or as was more frequently the case, the government would uh, simply amend its legislation in order to forestall this kind of judicial interpretation in the future. But those opportunities remained uh, present throughout the apartheid era. Uh, beyond South Africa, um, when did, uh, in the whole concept of, of the law used as an instrument of, of oppression, but open it, it's showing that it can open up a space for resistance and challenges. Can you tell us a, a few other cases around the world, maybe even within uh, Canada, over the years that have illustrated this point? Well, my, my, one of my favorite cases is a uh, Canadian case, and it comes from uh, the 1950s, a time when uh, we didn't have a constitution with an entrenched bill of rights, which gives judges the authority to invalidate statutes, when uh, a provision in the statutes violates a right in the bill of rights. And it's a case uh, called uh, Roncarelli and Duplessis. Duplessis was at the time the premier of Quebec. Roncarelli was a Jehovah's Witness. And the Jehovah's Witnesses were on a mission to convert the population of Quebec to their uh, creed. Uh, Duplessis deeply resented this, and uh, the Jehovah's Witness missionaries who were proselytizing in Quebec were being uh, locked up uh, in small towns in uh, Quebec. Roncarelli uh, owned a thriving restaurant in Montreal, and he was standing bail for these Jehovah's Witnesses so they would be released, go back to their missionary activity. And uh, Duplessis, in order to punish Roncarelli, ordered the liquor commissioner of Quebec to revoke Roncarelli's liquor license, which bankrupted him. This matter eventually wound up wound its way into the Supreme Court. And there the court was confronted with the following problem. The statute that gave the liquor commissioner his authority uh, did not lay down any conditions for the exercise of his authority. So at least one judge on the Supreme Court said that, uh, that this official could exercise his discretion as he pleased. But uh, Justice Ivan Rand, one of the greatest judges that uh, Canada has seen, in what's regarded as the main judgment in this case, said that if the official were uh, able to revoke uh, Ron Corelli's liquor license because of uh, a, a view in regard to his uh, religious faith, this would be the end of the rule of law and the end of constitutionalism in Canada. The liquor license could only be revoked for purposes relevant to the administration of uh, the statute. And, and that's a, a decision which is regarded as one of the uh, major decisions upholding the rule of law in Canada. It's uh, cited and quoted time and again by the Supreme Court of Canada, just because it states so boldly this rather simple proposition about uh, the rule of law. We're, we're going to come to some, some maybe more recent rulings, but are there some other cases um in the UK or, or in the US or elsewhere in the world that, that you've looked at over the years that, that show again how this can happen? Well, right now, uh, before uh, the House of Lords, there's a bill which is known as the Rwanda Bill, which is the statute that if it is uh, enacted, will uh, permit the government to deport those who seek asylum in the UK refugee claimants uh, to Rwanda. Now, the Supreme Court of this country decided some months ago that Rwanda is not a safe country for the purposes of uh, uh, Im immigration and refugee law. And what this bill does is it declares Rwanda to be a safe country. So it uh, removes from the courts and other institutions the authority to engage in the kind of factual inquiry in which the Supreme Court engaged. And it also removes from uh, judges the authority to uh, interpret uh, the uh, statute in ways that are consistent 
with uh, the UK's commitments to uh, human rights in its own uh, human rights statute. Uh, it it remo removes from them the uh, ability to uh, interpret the statute in light of uh, uh, international law and in light of other statutory law. It actually seeks to oust uh, courts altogether from the business of checking whether uh, people have uh, legitimate claims. And this bill might go the distance of uh, tampering with judicial power to the extent that uh, judges in the UK, which who normally accept the proposition that parliament is supreme and may enact any law it pleases, may find that they have to test that proposition. Because if uh, parliament has enacted a law that so flagrantly violates uh, the rule of law, the judges might conclude that that uh, alters the constitutional order in such a way that they have to invalidate the statute in order to preserve uh, the constitutional order, which it is their duty as judges to preserve. So you're, you're watching that, that one with interest. That must be fascinating as someone who's researched this over the years to see something playing out right before your eyes. It is fascinating, and it's, it's fascinating to see in a country which prides itself not only on uh, long adherence to the rule of law, but often claims uh, in a way to have invented the idea of the rule of law and then uh, given this idea to humanity so that we can all enjoy the benefits of the rule of law. We have in this country a government that seems determined uh, to uh, trample on uh, its commitment to the rule of law. You've written about uh, politically conservative judges who adopt, and I'm quoting you here, uh, a mechanical approach to the interpretation of the law, applying it without thought of its moral implications. What do you mean by the moral implications? Well, let me go with the example that I've uh, just uh, mentioned. If one accepts the proposition that Parliament is supreme and, uh, th and one supposes that it follows from that proposition, that Parliament may make any law that it pleases. So if tomorrow uh, the UK Parliament were to enact a technically valid statute that uh, turned uh, the UK into a dictatorship, judges might think that this law is uh, abominable, but what would have no option as judges but to defer to uh, that statute. I, th I think that's uh, a, a, a stance of interpretation that's mechanical and it's adopted without uh, reflecting on the moral implications of uh, the stance. But these implications aren't uh, confined to being moral implications. They are moral implications, but they're also legal implications. Because as I suggested just a couple of minutes ago, if the UK Parliament uh, does enact the statute that really removes judges from uh, this, the stage, removes, takes away the place that they should uh, occupy on uh, that stage, then that has dire moral implications, but it also has dire legal implications because it disturbs legal order and the idea of constitutionalism in such a way that judges have to take some note of the implications of deciding that because Parliament has said so, therefore, uh, they must uh, simply defer to what Parliament has said. Do you have concerns about, um, I would say, a new brand of conservative judges, whether it's in the United States or Canada, who are adopting a far from mechanical approach to interpretation? I, I, I do have uh, concerns because there's a new kind of conservative approach that's been ad advocated for uh, judges by prominent uh, academic lawyers in the uh, United States and in uh, this country. And uh, this, this uh, idea actually has uh, some significant traction in Canada and uh, in other countries. And it's an, uh, the idea that uh, judges shouldn't be trying to work out what, as a matter of fact, a parliament intended, 
but deciding on uh, the content of Parliament's uh, legislation uh, in light of an understanding of what's called uh, the common good. Now, now, this idea of the common good might seem uh, harmless. So no, no one uh, should be against uh, the common good. And it's uh, an excellent thing if what Parliament does when it legislates is that it legislates in the cause of the common good. But there's a very particular understanding of the common good that lies behind uh, this movement. And it's an understanding that, as I uh, see things, uh, seeks to uh, get rid of the distinction between uh, state and, and uh, church and to ensure that the common good that will uh, rule all of us is a common good that's uh, associated with a very conservative uh, understanding of uh, the Roman Catholic uh, tradition. So to put things uh, quite crudely, one uh, could say that this uh, new idea of what uh, judges should be doing is an idea that goes back to, in a way, a pre-modern time where it was thought appropriate that uh, the ruler should promulgate a conception of the common good in light of that uh, ruler's understanding of uh, what the true religion uh, decrees. And, and that I regard as, as a really troubling uh, development. Even here in Canada? Even here in uh, Canada, uh, there, there are uh, uh, legal scholars who are advocating just the idea of the common good, uh, which I've uh, sketched. Can, can the law lawyers and judges bring about regime change? I, I, I don't think that uh, judges certainly can uh, bring about a regime change. It, it, in the class that I'm teaching this uh, Thursday morning, as it happens, we're, we're focusing on a chapter from a, a book about uh, human rights lawyering uh, written by an Israeli uh, human rights lawyer called uh, Michael Svard. That's S-F-A-R-D. And Michael Svard uh, is one of the main uh, human rights lawyer working in Israel's occupied uh, territories. And he recounts at the beginning of the last chapter of his book an exchange between uh, himself and uh, the president of the uh, Israeli Supreme Court at the beginning of a judicial term. And the president uh, says to him, Mr. Svad, you're not hoping through your litigation to end the occupation. And he thinks to himself and he says to himself, no, there's no way that I can end the occupation. As a, a lawyer, I have to work within the framework of the law. And that means that uh, the opportunities that are available to me as a lawyer are uh, opportunities that the law itself affords. And I can't uh, make an argument to a judge about the illegitimacy of uh, the regime which the judge serves because judges start from an assumption that the regime is legitimate. So as a lawyer, I have to work with that uh, same assumption. The term rule of law is bandied about by all sides of the political spectrum these days, especially in, in, you know, we see it all the time in North America about it, what's going on in the U.S. Um, it seems that both Democrats and Republicans use it in different ways, but it's certainly a popular term. What does that term rule of law mean to you and how are you seeing others use or abuse the term? I have uh, rather a, a simple understanding of the rule of law, and, and it's one that I've already tried to uh, convey a couple of times through my examples, but, but let me try to make it explicit. I think that one has the rule of law when one has in place a state that uh, rules uh, through law that when the state uh, makes policies which it, which, which it wishes to implement, it will enact those policies into law, uh, give to officials the authority to implement those policies, and to judges the authority to check whether the officials, when they implement the policies, 
uh, stay within the limits of their legally uh, delegated authority. And so we have the rule of law when, uh, when officials act according to law. So, so when one challenges an official and says to the official, well, what's your authority to do what you've just done or, or want to do? The official has to be able to show that there's a legal basis for what the official wants to do. And that's all there is uh, to the rule of law, as far as I'm concerned. Problems start when, uh, and this would be uh, the case with uh, the Rwanda bill, if it becomes law. W when the authority that's delegated to an official is uh, extremely wide. So as in the uh, Ron Carelli and uh, Duplessis matter that I spoke about uh, some time ago, there the statute gave authority to the liquor commissioner to grant and revoke uh, liquor licenses. That's all the statute said. The judge in the Supreme Court who dissented said that because there were no conditions uh, laid down explicitly by the statute uh, for the granting or revocation of liquor licenses, therefore, taking the term from uh, the Bible, uh, the officials were a law unto themselves. If, uh, if that's the case, then uh, the rule of law becomes completely empty. And, and so in order to understand what it is for an official to act in accordance with the law, one has to go beyond the idea that all that matters is the terms in the statute uh, that delegate authority to the official. There are also principles and values that are associated with the rule of law. For example, that the official must act for proper purposes, the official must act uh, reasonably, the official may not act in a uh, discriminatory way. The official must give a hearing to someone before a decision is made affecting that person's important rights and interests. These are all values and principles that are associated with the rule of law, but they don't rise to the level of uh, the rights and freedoms that we associate with a constitutional document uh, like the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. The Israeli um, su <clears throat> excuse me, Supreme Court recently struck down a law that I know you know ver very well. It was worldwide headlines, the law passed by the, the Netanyahu government that would have diminished the court's power to provide a check on authoritarian laws. What were your thoughts on that ruling? Were you surprised by it um, and the ruling itself? Well, the... the the ruling itself, uh, in some sense, uh, didn't surprise me because what that statute did, as I understand things, was it removed from judges the authority to uh, check whether officials in exercising their uh, authority had exercised their authority reasonably. So it removed reasonableness as a basis for review. If reasonableness is removed as a basis for uh, judicial review, that means that one has to conclude that the officials may act unreasonably in carrying out uh, their uh, uh, legislative mandates. And if that's a conclusion one comes to, then uh, one has to have worries about whether one's living in a rule of law order anymore. So that uh, courts should... Uh, stand up for the rule of law in the way that they did in that decision is not in itself uh, surprising. What is surprising is that uh, the uh, timing of uh, the decision, right? Because this decision happened, was given during uh, the height of the war that's presently raging in that part of the world. And uh, it would not have been, I suppose, all that surprising had judges either tried to defer giving that decision to an, another time or uh, in the context had uh, decided uh, the other way. And one of the reactions to the decision from the government, I forget uh, from whom it may even have been from Netanyahu, the prime minister, 
was to accuse the judges of uh, disloyalty in uh, giving a decision of that kind during uh, this uh, time. But to accuse judges of disloyalty for maintaining uh, their loyalty to the rule of law is, I think, a, a rather uh, ridiculous accusation uh, to make. And here in Canada, we've seen a number of, of premiers talk about um, using the notwithstanding clause when, when um, you know, I, I remember when, when, you know, back in the day when the constitutional conferences were on, and it certainly, I think, was the intention then that this, the Section 33 would not be used very often. And I don't know how many times in the last year or so we've heard not just one province, but several provinces use use it. And have you been, do you have thoughts on that? There still is not a trend in uh, Canada to use Section 33. It's, it's been widely used only in, in uh, Quebec, not in other provinces. But you're right that uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, premiers have uh, started to threaten using uh, uh, Section 33 and have uh, on occasion uh, used it. Now, now, now Section 33 in, in itself, uh, I don't think is, is that problematic from a rule of law perspective. Why? Because it's a temporary derogation from uh, the, some of the rights in the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. It has to be uh, renewed, and uh, the timing of the renewal is such that uh, if uh, the public is upset by the Section 33 uh, use, then uh, they can vote a different government in at the next election. So it, it's, a, it's a temporary suspension of uh, rights commitments, not a, uh, an abolition of uh, those rights. Nevertheless, if it were used uh, as a matter of course by governments to get their way, that would uh, be evidence of a lack of commitment to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and maybe a lack of commitment to uh, the rule of law. The Rwanda bill that's uh, going through the UK Parliament now uh, is in a way, uh, in a way mimics the notwithstanding clause in the Canadian Constitution, because the uh, provisions in the bill that remove the power of the courts to adjudicate in accordance with uh, the legal commitments of uh, the order are, are all removed using the kind of notwithstanding uh, terminology that one finds in Section 33. So I, I do think it would be really worrying from a uh, uh, constitutional perspective and from a rule of law perspective, if uh, Canadian governments, including the federal government, started to uh, use uh, Section 33 to get their way as a matter of course. Uh, we're going to be coming up to, to questions from the audience uh, within a few minutes, so I just want to remind people who, who are viewing that you can submit your questions uh, in French or English. and. Um, we will get to them in a few minutes, but I wanted to ask you just about a couple of more things. Um, one of the books that you've written was about um, the law during the Weimar Republic, which uh, to many maybe uh, people in this day and age, they've forgotten about what that was. Um, can you explain that? And then I wanna ask you specifically during that time, did the which was in Germany between the wars? Did, did the courts and lawyers pave the way for Nazi rule? I, I became interested in uh, the Weimar period, so that's the period of uh, Germany's first experiment with uh, democracy from uh, roughly around uh, 1918 or 19 to uh, 1933 when the Nazi party uh, comes to power. Because uh, I thought it was important uh, to see, find out what had happened uh, in Germany prior to uh, 1933. And in order, uh, as you suggested, Scott, to try to think about what may have paved the way 
legally speaking, for uh, the Nazi uh, rise to power. And what I found when I spent a year uh, working in Germany in the early 90s and then continued to uh, work on this topic for uh, a few years until I produced a, a book on Weimar legal theory, is that uh, the debates in Weimar Germany uh, about constitutionalism and the rule of law were, were really rich debates and, actu and actually throw a lot of light, I think, on uh, debates that we're having uh, today. But there is also something about the political situation of uh, Germany, in the, especially in the late 1920s and early 1930s, uh, which uh, might seem to have some worrying echoes uh, in our world today. And that is that it was a time of, uh, of uh, acute political polarization, uh, distrust in democratic institutions, and people looking for solutions uh, to political problems outside of uh, the rule of law and uh, democracy. There is one uh, very significant uh, case that happens uh, during, uh, the, the, during 1932 that I, th I think is a, a big moment uh, in uh, the fall of the, of the Weimar Republic and therefore in the rise of the uh, Nazi uh, regime. And, and, and that is a, a case in which uh, the uh, federal government, which was uh, dominated by uh, conservative aristocrats, used the emergency powers provision of the Weimar Constitution to take away the power, the power, the legal powers of the Prussian uh, government. And Prussia was at the time the largest state in the German Federation. It was also uh, the bastion of uh, democratic resistance to the forces of the far right, also the forces of uh, the far left, uh, the communists. And uh, the court, uh, in effect, uh, upheld the uh, federal government's action in terms of uh, the emergency powers provision of the uh, Weimar Constitution. And uh, that decision, I think, and I'm, I'm not alone in this, uh, did uh, in a way prepare uh, Germans for uh, Hitler's enabling law in 1933, which declared his will to be the ultimate source of uh, German law. The, the ability to bypass parliament and uh, essentially uh, open the way to what happened after that. So you've written a fantastic article for the conversation that's uh, in both, uh, which we publish in both English and French. And, and the premise is the similarity between that period in Germany uh, before the Second World War and what's going on in the United States right now. So tell us your thoughts on that. When I started uh, thinking about what I should say in this article, it so happened there was an interview in one of the major newspapers uh, with Bernie Sanders, Senator Bernie Sanders. And, and Sanders uh, said that if uh, Trump becomes president of the United States again, then uh, the United States will be uh, like uh, Weimar Germany, referring to this time of extreme political polarization, uh, the end of democracy, and uh, so on. And uh, I, I contested uh, Sanders's claim only to the extent of saying, but I suppose it's uh, quite a big difference, that I think the, in uh, significant respects, the US is already like Weimar Germany. Why? Because uh, democratic institutions are under threat. The only reason that we have uh, President Biden in place and uh, still uh, respect for uh, democracy is that uh, small D Democrats were prepared to uphold uh, the rule of law during the last presidential election. And what I mean by small d uh, Democrats is not uh, members of uh, the uh, Democratic Party, but those Republican judges and those Republican uh, elect election officials and even Vice President Pence, who were prepared to uh, 
maintain their uh, obligation of uh, fidelity to law. The, the, that uh, sense of obligation, I think, is entirely missing from uh, the MAGA wing of the Republican Party. And it's not clear uh, how many uh, Republicans uh, remain what I've called uh, small D Democrats. And that's why I think that uh, the present day uh, United States is much more like uh, Weimar Germany in the 1930s than uh, Bernie Sanders seemed to suggest. Well, that really leads us into one of the first questions we've got from the audience, from, from Josephine. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on the rule of law as a measure of a healthy democracy? The rule of law as a measure of a healthy democracy. If you as a, a, a citizen of Canada are subject to a decision by an official that affects your uh, rights or interests, and you are unable to question that official's authority to do whatever the official did. Or if you know that if you do uh, question that official's authority and go before a court, that the courts of your uh, legal order are utterly supine, so they will just up uphold uh, the official's decision, whatever the official did. Then you'll uh, know that you're not only living in a uh, country which no longer respects uh, the rule of law, but you're also living in a country which I, I think has uh, uh, lost sight of its commitment to democracy, because it's not clear to me that one can have democracy without the rule of law. D democracy is supposed to be a political system in which, amongst other things, there is accountability uh, by those who rule us to uh, we the ruled. And uh, if uh, we can't uh, get from officials the legal basis for what they do to us in the name of the law, then we no longer have accountability. One can't have uh, democracy without the rule of law. Uh, Robert asks, uh, why do you think judge appointments, I assume maybe he means but, but the Supreme Court, but maybe all judges, appointments in Canada seem less controversial or polarizing as they do um, in the U.S. and in particular the Supreme Court? I think it's an excellent question. It's not that uh, judicial appointments are uncontroversial in Canada, but it's certainly the case that uh, they're not nearly as controversial as uh, uh, they are in the United States of America. And it's, it's also the case that uh, there still is in Canada, as far as I know, when I last looked at uh, these opinion polls, there still is uh, a huge amount of trust in our judicial institutions, whereas in the United States of America for years now, the Supreme Court has had one of the lowest uh, in indicators of, of trust of any in the of any uh, supreme apex court in a uh, Western uh, democracy. Why is that the case? It's because it's widely perceived by uh, uh, people in the United States and also uh, by people outside that uh, judges vote on the Supreme Court in accordance with their political views. And so if you have a majority of Republicans, as is the case now, you will get uh, our decisions with uh, the kind of content that the Republican Party uh, favors. In Canada, there still is a, f a faith that judges judge according to law rather than according to their political preference. A, a former Chief Justice of Canada, who happened to be uh, Roman Catholic, used to say when he gave talks about his uh, role as a Supreme Court judge that he had been in the majority in uh, the Morgenthaler decision, the, the decision that made uh, 
abortion available to uh, Canadian women. And uh, he made this point in order to uh, tell his audience that when it came to uh, deciding what the law required, he checked his uh, own uh, religious beliefs at the door because these beliefs were not uh, relevant to uh, deciding on uh, what the law required. And uh, I think the reason that we still have uh, some, uh, a lot of faith in our judges in Canada and the reason why our judicial appointments aren't uh, as controversial as uh, they are in the United States is that we still trust that uh, judges will decide according to law. And that trust has been earned by courts over the years. And I, I've often wondered if it's if it's the way that the selection process is. I mean, it was not that long ago in the United States when someone like um, uh, Justice Bader, I think, got almost unanimous support um, by the Senate, it, both Republicans. And now it's almost always on, on party lines. Um, and then that, to me, seems that it makes the whole process more political. And we just don't seem to see that yet in Canada. It's, it's very difficult to design a, a perfect uh, process for uh, selecting judges. And in Canada, although there have been some attempts to uh, make uh, the process a little more transparent, it's still the case that that process happens behind uh, closed doors. And it's uh, within the prerogative of the Prime Minister to choose judges, and uh, that choice is made by, uh, in, uh, in, after a series of discussions uh, to which uh, the public, by and large, does not have access. And uh, that, of course, can create uh, problems. It's not the case also that having a, an open process as is uh, the case in uh, the United States of America when it comes to the selection of Supreme Court justices, that that necessarily uh, results in having a partisan uh, court. Because as, as you said, Scott, uh, some years ago, it was uh, not the case that uh, the Supreme Court had this reputation of being uh, a, a place where uh, politics, ordinary politics happens, something changed in the last few years. And uh, I think that it's more that uh, the politics around judicial appointments changed than that the process itself was flawed because the process used to work pretty well in the past. And, and you have an organization in the United States like the Federalist Society which all the focus is normally on the Supreme Court, but both parties, I think, you know, make the case of, of getting all the federally appointed judges into place because they're essentially lifetime appointments, right? So again, it's, it's a politicized um, system throughout, throughout the, uh, the whole process. Yes, it, it's become highly politicized and, uh, and, the, the fact that uh, that leads to a complete lack of trust in uh, the institution of the Supreme Court uh, tells one, I think, that, uh, that the public generally operates with a, an understanding of a distinction between uh, ordinary politics and uh, law. And that there's an expectation that when the issue is whether something is in accordance with the law, that the decision as to whether it's in accordance with the law will not be dictated by the political preferences of uh, the person who's charged with making that decision. And it's the collapse of that distinction that I think has led to the present situation in the US. Um, the need to ask a question uh, from the audience, does the rule of law apply during wartime? And, and if so, what are the checks and balances in place for the rule of law? Um, she asks, how do you correct 
uh, course correct if the rule of law goes off course, as in the case of uh, the Rwanda genocide in 1994. How does the current rule of law apply in the current ruling of, of Israel? That does the rule of law apply during wartime? Of, of, of course it does. I, I, I think that the, the, the question can be asked at, at different levels. But that can be asked at the level of uh, does the, the rule of law apply when it comes to governing uh, the war that breaks out between uh, two countries? And yes, it does. There, there are uh, inter international laws that uh, govern the way that uh, wars are supposed to be conducted. It's uh, difficult to enforce uh, those laws because, after all, the countries are at war. But there is a clear understanding of uh, the law that governs uh, warfare. I, I th but I think the question perhaps pertains more, I might be wrong about this, to what happens within a country when the country is uh, at war. And when a country is at war, there's no reason to suppose that the rule of law uh, should go by uh, the wayside. If the ordinary courts remain open, as they usually do, then they can adjudicate on what uh, officials are entitled to do according to the principles that apply in peacetime. And it's perfectly possible to, uh, to do that, as courts have shown uh, over the years. Sometimes courts have uh, lacked the courage to uh, adjudicate as they would uh, during ordinary times uh, at a time of war. But as uh, perhaps the uh, Israeli Supreme Court's ruling uh, that we talked about just a while ago shows, it is possible for the courts to do their job even during the highly fraught situation of, of, of a war. Um, further to Israel, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the, the judgment, the provisional ruling that came out for the International Court of Justice. Question from, from Josie is, what are your thoughts about the development uh, of the rule of law and the ruling by the, the ICJ? The, the ruling by the ICJ is a ruling uh, from a, 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 a court which uh, has a high standing, it's staffed by judges, I think 17 judges from all over the world. Uh, there was one judge who uh, dissented, I think, in all respects, but even uh, the uh, judge from Israel, a very distinguished jurist, uh, Ron Barak, uh, joined uh, the majority judgment uh, on a couple of significant issues. So now we have uh, a ruling from uh, an authoritative body, uh, which, and it's in respect of a convention, uh, which uh, the parties uh, are, are before the court are uh, parties to the genocide convention. Uh, bo both parties to the matter uh, South Africa and uh, Israel chose to argue the matter. And uh, if one does make that choice, then one is bound by the ruling. So it will be interesting to see how uh, that ruling uh, plays out in uh, the next while. We have a question from, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Matin. Um, should the Canadian Supreme Court implement an age limit for its judges? I, I, I think it does, doesn't it? Uh, but the US, the U.S. court does not. Um, the, 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 there, the, 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 there is an age limit. Yeah. So I'm, I'm bad at remembering this kind of fact, but I'm pretty sure it's something around uh, 75. 75 uh, in Canada. Yeah, Canadian Supreme Court judges have to uh, retire at a certain age. And I think that's uh, all to the good. But in the States, um, it, it's, a fa it's a fascinating part of the politics of that court where um, they time their retirement um, around who's president and who's not president. Um, and, and it's very, um, it's very strange, I think, when we see that living up here. Yes, I, th I think that's just a, uh, a symptom of the kind of uh, political uh, 
makeup of uh, the court as it's existed for the last several years. We have a question from Ken Bryan. You've expressed concern, concern with conservative judges making decisions based on their view of the common good. Is it also true that liberal leaning judges do the same thing when striking down laws or policies enacted by elected legislators? And we had another question that are the Democrats just as guilty as the Republicans of, of playing that game in the U.S.? I, I, I don't think the issue should be necessarily characterized as whether it's conservative judges who are uh, doing the striking down or uh, liberal judges. I, th I think the uh, issue is, are the judges uh, deciding the matter according uh, to law? Can they show that when they give their decision that they have... Uh, provided uh, appropriate legal grounds for uh, that decision. And uh, it's when we trust judges to do that, that we can move away from uh, worrying too much about whether judges are conservatives or uh, liberals. The kind of conservative trend I was uh, sketching is a trend which, as I understand it, uh, says to judges, that they can, to some extent, put aside the law and inject their uh, values into the law. And uh, I, th I think uh, that's as bad when uh, judge liberal judges do it as when uh, conservative judges uh, do it. When it comes to the issue as between uh, Republicans and Democrats and the appointment of judges in the U.S., it might be that they, both parties are now doomed to playing the same game. So it's not uh, clear to me that uh, Democrats will uh, be more virtuous when uh, they have uh, the power that Republicans have enjoyed in the last uh, several years. So uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to ask you one final question. I, I think you're not the only one, I certainly feel this way, that we're worried about the state of many Western democracies. And my last question for you is, how can the law come to the rescue? And we have we have about uh, one minute for this, David. In uh, the 1940s, a, a great American judge, Learned Hand, uh, gave a talk in uh, Central Park called The Spirit of Liberty, at a time when the war was not going well for the Allies. And he said to the crowd assembled in uh, Central Park that you shouldn't expect uh, the law or the Constitution to save you. The love of liberty, he said, uh, lies in the hearts of men and women. Where it dies there, then no law, no Constitution can save us. That's my answer to the question. I agree with uh, Learned Hand. That's a perfect way to end what I think has been a fantastic um, conversation. Um, David, it's been a pleasure to get to know you over the last couple of weeks. We've spoken a couple of times. Um, again, I would encourage people to read the article that you've written for the conversation, which focuses on the United States and is it the same as pre-war Germany. Um, I want to thank everyone in the audience for all their, their thoughtful questions, our friends at Shirk. Um, these are great sessions and there'll be another one coming up. So, so watch for that. And, um, I'd like to wish all of you, uh, a great rest of your day and goodbye for now. Oh, we're sorry. I'm throwing it back to Ted. Sorry, Ted. Oh, just to say thank you to David. Thank you to you, Scott. Amazing, uh, session, uh, you know, really great questions. Just a fantastic opportunity to speak with the folks, you know, who are doing their research, you know, that's helping to us to understand and change our world where it needs to be changed. So thank you again, Dave. Just great to see you again. And thanks, Scott, for your your fantastic work in moderating this uh, this session. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks to you. And thanks to Shirk. Sure.